Pamu ISI Kolkata. And for young students, he is one of the first uh, persons or researchers who started this area of uh, work in uh, quantum information. And basically, his thesis was on foundations of quantum mechanics. And then back in the, the late 1980s and uh, early 1990s, this information theory was just coming up globally. And uh, Professor Kaur was one of the first persons in the whole country who started work in this area. And uh, since then, of course, he, his early works was uh, on a, a word uh, related to uh, unsharp measurement formalism, the famous Paul Bush, uh, I mean, formalism. And since then, he has done a number of very notable and high impact works on quantum uh, contextuality and quantum non-locality. And not only that, he has produced a series of very fascinating, wonderful young students who today form the next generation, I would say the second generation of leading quantum information theorists in the country. So uh, with these few words, let me welcome Professor Guru Prashad Kaur again, and uh, you, can, you can please uh, start your talk and share your slides. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Norchun. <clears throat> so let me share my screen. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's visible. Uh, yeah, it has come now. If you can make it full screen. I think that. Oh. Or slideshow, if you, yeah, if you can start slideshow. <clears throat> so once again, thanks to Orchon for this nice introduction and uh, the organizer of this program, especially Professor Panigrahi. <clears throat> but I thought it to be a summer program. Uh, so I was thinking that many students will participate in this in this program. And that's why I have not, I have not prepared any special, uh, special uh, research work. Rather, uh, I was thinking that many newcomers in this field will be joining this summer program. So I have prepared very elementary lectures. So uh, maybe some people, they are well taught well uh, trained in this field. Uh, for them, it will be a very, very elementary one. But still, let me go. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the title is Creative Use of Entanglement in Information Processing. And in this work, actually, I will be talking about dense coding, standard dense coding that we have uh, we have been taught uh, in our uh, earlier lectures and in some textbook also you can find it. And from there we'll, uh, using this more, more uh, uh, advanced use of dense coding, we'll do something, some another entanglement processing task. You can call it fingerprinting, but I will describe the thing. But I will start from this elementary quantum mechanics. So with the same, so let us, yeah, this. <clears throat> so what are the distinguished feature of quantum mechanics? <clears throat> and the three distinguishing feature that you see in this slide, uncertainty principle, no cornering principle, and existence of entanglement. And all these three are actually now well known even beyond, even outside of our subjects of quantum information. So people know, and especially uncertainty is known to all learned people, I think. And nowadays, no cloning principle of quantum mechanics has been also very popular, and also about entanglement. So uncertainty principle tells that, actually there are two versions of uncertainty principle, maybe three versions, but I'll be discussing here two versions. So certain pair of observable does not admit joint measurement. So like position, momentum, or speed along different direction, they are observables in quantum mechanics, which cannot be jointly measured. <clears throat> so far as you consider perfect measurement. And there are other another version of quantum uncertainty principle, which are actually textbook uncertainty principle, which tells that certain pair of observable can never be defined for any quantum state. You find it in your textbook. 
uh, in terms of position and momentum. Then we then it's no cloning principle discovered in 1982 by Utters and Jurek. It tells that unknown quantum state can neither be cloned nor be determined, nor be determined part is not there. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Guru Prashad, uh, your yes. slide is not moving. Your slide is not. We are still in the first slide. So, uh, maybe. Uh, now it is moving? No, 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 no. Maybe uh, can you go back and uh, share full screen? Maybe you are uh, sharing only the slide. Yeah, now it is moving. Yes, yes. Now it is moving. Now, if I make it full screen, then it is problem? No, no, no. So we are not seeing full screen, but now we are seeing the change of the slide. So for example... But I have made full screen in, in my uh, end. No, no, no. It is not coming here full screen. So maybe... So, you, yeah, if you can exit this one and uh, reshare again and share the whole screen, then probably it will be better. So what should I do? Maybe you can exit this uh, shared screen and again share and share the full screen. And from the full screen, you can uh, get to- How to exit? Uh, uh, go to share screen and then you can- Yeah, I have, go, I have, I have gone to share screen, and but maybe can... it's not working. Okay, so no problem, no problem. So this one, so we are now, we are looking at your uh, the second slide, distinguishing features of quantum mechanics. So now it is- yeah. Now it is- Now it's moving? Yeah, now it is moving. Now it is yeah. very fine. Yeah. So these are the three features, well-known features of quantum mechanics. And last one is uh, last one is the existence of entangled state. So regarding entanglement, in a popular term, you can tell that if you consider more than uh, one system, I mean, at least uh, bipartite system or more than uh, two systems, then the global state is definite. But local state, I mean, marginal state is not definite. So all this, if you look at this, all this principle carefully, then actually they are, actually all are no-go states. Means. Like uncertainty principle, you cannot do something. No cloning also, you cannot do something. Entanglement means there are states for, whose, for which local marginals are not, Definite. I mean, you cannot express them in terms of a single unit vector. So these are the axioms of quantum mechanics. Actually, quantum mechanics till now has to be described in a very mathematical form, uh, where it tells that system is associated with a Hilbert space. The states are actually unit vectors in that Hilbert space. Actually. Uh, there are more general description for a state, which is described by density operator acting on this Hilbert space, but we, we are remaining in the lower level. And observable are represented by self-adjoint operator acting on the Hilbert space. And if you perform some measurement of some observable, then eigenvalues are the only possible measurement results. And they are, then there is bond rule, which tells that if you prepare a system, if you consider a quantum system in some state psi, and if you consider the measurement of some observable A, now A is a self-adjoint operator, so it will give you give you, give you eigenvalues and eigenstates, and you can find it by solving the characteristics equation, and being a self-adjoint operator, all these eigenvalues are real, and now, if you ask this question, if my initial state is shy and if I perform the measurement of A, then it is true that I am getting one of the eigenvalues as a measurement result. But if you ask this question, if my initial state is this, what is the possibility that I get the ith eigenvalue as my measurement result, then Born rule gives you the result that if you, you have to take the inner product of the initial state and the corresponding eigenstates, take the inner product and take the mod and the square it, you get the probability. So quantum mechanics does not specify a definite value for the observable, rather it tells what, with what frequency or with what probability we'll be getting a particular result. Now come quantum dynamics. Quantum dynamics, 
quantum dynamics, there are two actually two quantum dynamics. One is when you perform the result and other is when you are not performing any measurement. When you perform the measure, uh, measurement, then if you consider our earlier case, if I can value is your measurement result, then immediately the state collapses to this corresponding eigenstate phi i. It is an irreversible process. It will jump. Whatever the initial state is, it will jump to the corresponding eigenstate. And when you are not performing any measurement, then actually the evolution of the state is unitary, where unitary oper operator is characterized by this equation. And if you know that your quantum state at time t is equal to zero, then you can find the state at time t is equal to capital T, which you get by performing this unitary operator, where this unitary operator is the function of the Hamiltonian in this form and h being the Hamiltonian of the system. Now come a special measurement called Strang-Gallach experiment. In terms of Strang-Gallach experiment, actually, we will understand these quantum rules in an elaborate way, because if you know the key, how the qubit behaves, then actually you can do all the quantum information theory. Uh, so this Strang-Gallach experiment tells that if you perform the measurement of spin angular momentum, then nature is such that you get only two again, two possible measurement result. One is, it should be maybe h cut by two. So it can be either plus h cut by two or minus h cut by two, but you can associate them to plus one and minus one. In quantum mechanics, spin up system is associated with a two dimensional complex Hilbert space. How can I tell this thing? Because there are only two possible measurement results. That's why, if you consider a spin-up system and you don't consider other properties of that particle, then actually it can be associated with a two-dimensional complex silver space, which is the simplest silver space that we can imagine. Now, if you consider this spin system, then you can get these obser observable, uh, observables like spin measurement along z axis, along x axis, along y axis. They are represented by this two cross two simple, these two cross two operators or two cross two matrix. And interestingly, if you solve the eigenvalues of, for all these three operators, you get only plus one and minus one. So from your quantum rules, quantum rules tells that eigenvalues are possible measurement results. And now you see that in either, in one of these three direction, in whichever direction you measure, you get either up or down. So, so you can tell that quantum axioms has been designed in such a way that it can mimic the measurement results. Again, you can find the corresponding eigenvalues, eigenvectors, I, 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 corresponding eigenvector for sigma j, sigma x, and sigma y, and you can see they are not same, they are different. That's why these three measurements are different. They may have same eigenvalues, but they have different, different eigenvectors. That's why it is interesting. <clears throat> and now we'll see, uh, sometimes maybe I use this symbol, sometimes I will, uh, this symbol get zero for, up eigenvectors of sigma z, k1, for down eigenstate of sigma z, and similarly 0x, 1x, or plus, minus. Sometimes I will be using all those notation. <coughs> now, take the example of spin measurement. So if you consider this state, which is up eigenstate of sigma z, if you measure sigma z on this state, then actually you are you know definitely that measurement result will be plus one because if you calculate the bond probability, it will definitely give you one. But instead of measuring sigma z, if you measure sigma x on this state, up eigen state of sigma z, then result is completely uncertain. Results are com equally, equally probable. So both probability will be half and half. And of course the state will, if the result is plus one, the state will collapse to up eigen state of sigma x, if the result is down, then the initial state will collapse to down eigenstate of sigma x. And similarly, for sig, uh, similarly, if you consider sigma up eigenstate of sigma x as your initial state, 
then if you measure sigma z again results are equally probable both results are equally probable now obviously now you are getting uncertainty relation for spin up system because for this state sigma z is completely certain but sigma x are completely uncertain similarly if you consider this up eigen state of sigma x then sigma x is completely certain but sigma z is completely uncertain and not only that if you try to find out a state for which sigma z and sigma is both are certain you will not find it because there is no state for which both sigma z and sigma x are certain it is like position and momentum where you cannot find any state where both position and momentum will be very certain so it is just uncertainty in terms of spin variables now we are coming to non orthogonal states now we pose a problem because if you are given one of two orthogonal state like left you are given a particle and the particle has been prepared either in either in either in zero or one then if i ask you by giving you the particle what is the state of the particle then you can definitely answer because you will measure sigma z if you get up then the initial state will be zero or if the if you get down initial state will be one you can correctly answer because they are eigen state of sigma z and they are orthogonal also but here the question that has been posed this is peculiar they are two non orthogonal state it can be uh, it, it is either eigen up eigen state of sigma z or up eigen state of sigma x now if i give you the particle or alice gives the particle to bob then can bob determine the state now you see let bob measure sigma z then if his result is plus 1 he cannot come to any conclusion because plus 1 result for sigma z can come from the zero as well as it can come from zero x also so bob will fail to answer the question correctly but fortunately if his result is minus 1 then minus 1 result cannot come from k0 state because the bond probability will be zero then he can correctly tells the state particle has been prepared in the state 0x which is up eigen state of sigma x similarly if he measures sigma x in a state of sigma z then also for plus one results he will fail but when the result is down he will correctly answer now so this is this is i i discussed only two possible measurements but there may be huge number of measurements and also there are there may be more general measurement which is called pov so one may think that there may be some appropriate measurement for by which the two state can be discriminated but the i am not going to prove this uh, issue but uh, th th this is true in quantum mechanics that two non orthogonal state can neither be cloned nor be determined i am not going to prove that it cannot be cloned or determined but i am telling you as a statement but it can be proved easily that two non orthogonal state can neither be cloned nor determined conclusively <coughs> now we are coming to composite system because we want to discuss entanglement now if you consider two systems system s1 and system s2 s1 is associated with say hilbert space h1 and s2 is associated with h2 now if you consider a joint state of particle 1 and 2 and if they can be written in this form that means this unit vector for particle 1 and 2 can be factorized that means another unit vector for particle 1 tensor product another uh, unit vector for particle 2 if this state can be written in this form then we call it a product state or separable state now if you so let us see the example consider psi a psi 1 2 which is alpha 0 for particle 1 1 for particle 2 plus b one for particle 1 1 for particle 2 had these all these 0 1 or eigen state of sigma z then actually though it looks 
there are two terms, but basically it can be factorized because these state can be written as that these unit vector a zero plus b one for particle one tensor product one for particle two. So though the state has two term in this basis, but finally it can be written as product of two unit vector. So these are separable state. But instead of taking this state, if you consider this state. Which is a zero zero plus b one one, where a and b both are non-zero, then actually um, you cannot factorize it. You can you, you you can try and we will see that this cannot be factorized, and this is called uh, entangled state. And as I was telling you in the definition of entangled state, at least for pure state, that this is a unit vector, but this is the unit vector in the In the tensor product Schiller space of H1 tensor H2, but if you try to find out the state of the marginal system, then you will not get a unit vector that can be represented by density matrix, which I am not going to discuss in in this lecture. Now let us let us be associated uh, with some unitary operators. Again, acting on two-dimensional complex Hilbert space. Already, we have discussed sigma x, sigma y, sigma z are self-adjoint operators, but luckily they are also unitary operators. Sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. So these these sigma operators, they are very beautiful operators. They are self-adjoint operators, and so you can think of measuring those operators. At the same time, they can behave also as Unitary operators and action of these unitary operators. I have described some of them, like sigma z acting on zero gives you zero. Sigma z acting on one just state remains unchanged but with a phase factor. Similarly, sigma x it it acts as a flip operator. Sigma x acting on zero gives you one, and sigma x acting on one gives you zero. Then comes the Hadamard gate, another important gate, very very useful in quantum computing. H acting on zero gives you equal superposition of zero and one, but with a plus sign. And H acting on one again again equal superposition of zero and one, but with a minus sign. Then if you consider a two qubit unitary gate, the most important gate that useful for, and again very very important for quantum computing. So it is called U C not C not gate, and it acts in this way. So if it acts on x and y, it gives you x and x plus y modulo, where the sum is modulo two. So if you break them, uh, if you want to define the or C not operation on this basis, then zero zero. So the feature is if your state of the first qubit is zero, then nothing is changed. The state remains same. But the state of the first qubit is one. Then second qubit is flipped, so one zero goes to one one and one one goes to one zero. This is a very beautiful property. Using this thing, you can entangle two qubits which are initially product state. So if you start from two qubits where both are in zero zero, then if you put Hadamard on the first qubit and then if you apply C not on both these qubits, then finally you get a entangled state one by root two zero zero plus one one. <clears throat> and that if you if you run the reverse operation, so first C not gate where first one first qubit is source, second qubit is target, uh, target, and then if you put the Hadamard on the first qubit, then you get back the original state zero zero. So you can entangle two qubits, and similarly you can disentangle also. Two qubits maximally entangled state by using just elementary operation like Hadamard and C not operation. And if you consider full set of Bell states, full set of orthogonal Bell states, so there are four Bell states: phi plus, phi minus, phi plus, phi minus. You can check that they are orthogonal states. And if you apply this reverse operation that I that I Described here, if you apply this operation on these four Bell states, so this phi plus goes to zero zero, phi minus goes to one zero, 
psi plus goes to zero one and psi minus goes to one one. Is there any problem? No, everything is fine. Okay. Fine, fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Now, by measuring the two qubits in this uh, zero one basis, that means by performing the measurement of sigma z, you can identify which Bell state you have been given if you are supplied with these two qubits in a Bell state. So, if you are supplied two qubits, which are which have been prepared, which has been prepared in one of these four Bell states, how can you distinguish among these four Bell states? You just perform this operation. I mean, first C naught and then Hadamard on the first qubit. Then you get four states, four product states, which are again orthogonal. And then you can uh, you can measure sigma z on both these qubits. And looking at the results, you can identify which Bell state you have been given. And in particular, uh, Professor Panigrahi uh, described this thing in his in a earlier work. And maybe this has been performed in our uh, Bangalore lab. Now we are coming to power of entanglement. And this is very, very important. So let us consider a set of unitary operators acting on a qubit. So these are a set of unitary operators acting on a qubit. There are four possible unitary operators u1, u2, u3, u4. Now you consider two qubits, first qubit is in alpha and second qubit is in beta, they are in a product state. Now, if you, now, if you, now you consider these four possible states. That means first, first state is U1 acting on alpha, tensor beta. Second state is U2 acting on alpha, tensor beta. Similarly, U3, alpha, tensor beta, and U4, alpha tensor beta. Now, this can never be orthogonal set. So there are four possible states. Now, my question is whether this four state can be orthogonal states. It is not possible that you can check easily that these four states can never be orthogonal because the unitary operator is acting on, a, on one qubit only. And if you consider the Hilbert space associated with the one qubit, it is two dimensional. So it can contain almost two orthogonal operators and second q, the state of the second qubit remain unchanged. So these four states can never be orthogonal. Whatever unitary operators you want, you two, three, you two, you choose. Because the dimensional restriction. But entanglement makes it possible. Entanglement makes a big difference. Because if you start from this phi plus state for these two qubits, instead of taking this product state, if you consider an entangled state phi plus, then if, so Bob is not performing any operation. If Alice also per, does not perform any operation, phi plus remains phi plus. But in a state, if in a state of performing identity, if Alice performs sigma j operations, as a unitary operation, then phi plus goes to phi minus. If Alice applies sigma x as a unitary operator on, on the first qubit, then phi plus goes to psi plus. And if Alice applies first sigma j, then sigma x, then phi plus goes to psi minus. This is very, very powerful thing. You started with a single two qubit state and you are acting on one side only, one of the qubits by some unitary operators. And you are getting four possible orthogonal states. You can generate the four possible orthogonal states. Actually, maybe physicists knew this thing a long time back, that entangled state works in this way. But Bennett and Weisner first could understand that this is a very beautiful thing which can be used in quantum information processing. And in this way, actually, superdense coding was born in 1992 by Bennett and Weisner. So let us discuss about quantum dense coding. <clears throat> so quantum dense coding, uh, uh, we consider two, two level. 
if we consider two two level classical system two level means it may be two energy level or two color whatever it is i have used here color so if you consider two two level uh, two two level classical system it, it can have only two possible states here it is like red or red ball or black ball but if you consider two a two level quantum system now you know that it is associated with a two dimensional hilbert space so how many states can be there in classical world only two possible uh, pure state either uh, red one or black one but if you consider two two level quantum uh, two level quantum system uh, there can be infinitely many different state because zero is a possible state one is a possible state but any a0 plus b1 with mod a square plus mod b square is equal to 1 is a possible state so there are infinitely many different states so it might seem that one two level quantum system can be used to encode enormous classical information because even for two level quantum system there are infinitely many different states so let us consider a scenario a game so let there is alice and bob bob and they are far away uh, so so alice is watching a cricket match between india and pakistan and this result of the match has to be conveyed to bob and there are four possibility india may win india may lose game may be draw and game may be abandoned now to convey this result if they use classical system two level classical system then you can easily understand that two balls has to be sent to bob to convey the information of the result of the matches if you consider two level classical system then two two level quantum system have, have to be used to convey the result of the matches but if we come if we if we come to quantum encoding then actually we don't need to use to a two two level Uh, quantum system because single two level quantum system can have infinitely many quantum states so we can encode in this way if india wins then it is, a state should be prepared in zero if india loses a state should be prepared in one if game is drawn then a state should be prepared in eigen state of sigma up eigen state of sigma x and if game is abandoned the state should be prepared in down i guess state of sigma x and these four are different states and the particle will be sent to bob and by identifying the state bob will be knowing the result of the match but i think you can appreciate that this is not possible this is not possible because these four states are not orthogonal because it is a two dimensional hilbert space and in a two dimensional hilbert space you cannot have four orthogonal vectors so they must be non orthogonal state and not only that they are actually linearly dependent set so even there is the probability uh, identifying any one of these state the probability of identifying these state is zero so rather bob will not get any information by identifying these state because he cannot identify the states itself so no information will be conveyed from alice to bob if the result of the matches is encoded in these four possible quantum states but but quantum quantum mechanics give you a nice advantage in this case in quantum mechanics also you need two qubits but after the end of the game actually alice can send just single qubit so if we if we come to the question in this way in this fashion that okay in so in classical world to encode this message two 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 level classical systems are required and quantum case also as we saw that with one quantum system we cannot manage but two quantum system two quantum systems are required to convey this message but now in the classical world if we come to this question that okay 
if before the start of the match alice sends one system and after the match alice can send another system then is it possible to convey the result of the match any problem rochon no i think some people are unmuted so could you please mute yourself whoever is talking yeah thank you thank you very much yeah yeah in classic okay thank you thank you yeah so in classical world if if the ball if the red ball or black ball that we have used for encoding if alice has to send one of the ball before the start of the match and one ball and she is allowed to send another ball after the end of the match then even in classical world it is not possible to convey the result of the match now we you will see in quantum world if x still two qubits are required to convey the result of the match but in quantum world surprisingly one qubit can be sent before the start of the match and after the end of the match another qubit has to be sent to bob and you will see success bob will successfully encode the uh, decode the result of the match this happens because 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 this entanglement uh, makes a difference by acting on by acting on one side of the qubit by some unitary operators different different unitary operators you can start it from a single bell state you can you can go to other possible orthogonal bell states so this is the beauty of quantum entanglement so the protocol is something like this in the initial stage before the result before the start of the match alice and bob will share this pi plus state and stage 2 alice will apply either identity or sigma j or sigma x or sigma z sigma x depending on the result of the match and then after this unitary uh, application of these unitary operations alice will send the her qubit to bob so finally bob will get both the qubits and problem of bob is to differentiate among these four bell states and this can be done easily because already we have seen that if you perform c not operation then hadamard operation then different different bell state go to different different product state phi plus goes to 0 0 phi minus goes to 1 0 psi plus goes to 0 1 psi minus goes to 1 1 and bob easily can make measurement of sigma j on both the qubit and by looking at the result he can identify which particular unitary operator has been applied by alice and because of this encoding of this result of the measurement in this unitary operators bob can know the result of the matches so this is the essence of super dense coding now we will slightly generalize this protocol to have a uh, another protocol uh, which i have named here fingerprinting but maybe some other name can be given uh, to this protocol and it is actually some some subset of more general problem like distributed computing with limited communications and the general problem is something like this alice some alice alice has some input a bob has some input b and charlie has to calculate some function which is a function of both a and b now charlie can compute this function if he has the information both of a and b question is a has to be sent to charlie and similarly information of b has to be sent by bob to charlie and finally charlie will compute this function here the challenge is what is the minimum amount of communication from alice and bob to charlie that this function can be that the peculiar function that you define that can be computed <clears throat> this is the general problem i have considered a very special case and this was solved by uh, this uh, some of my students along with some other collaborators and this is the archive reference maybe this has been published in some journal and they have named it is authentication authentication with limited communication and 
I prefer to call it fingerprinting. Now let me let me tell what the problem is. Problem is something like this. Alice has two bits. First bit is A1, second bit is A2. Similarly, Bob has two bits. First bit is B1, second bit is B2, where A1, A2, and B1, B2 on can be either 0 or 1. And maybe first bit, first bit gives you the information regarding whether uh, the person is male or female. So zero means male, one means female. And second bit gives you the information regarding the nationality, like zero is in quotes Indian, one means foreigner. Now, Alice and Bob has these two uh, information and some referee has to compare their uh, bits. So referee has to compare these bits, Alice's bits and Bob bits. Compare means so either A1 is equal to B1 and A2 is equal to B2, or there may be four cases actually. <clears throat> there may be four different cases. They are completely same. Alice's bits and Bob bits are completely same. All are 0, 0, or, or 0, 1, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 0, or 1, 1, 1, 1. Or second case may be differ in the second position. And the first bits are same. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Here first bits are same and they are equal to 0. And here also first bits are same. Second bits is different. And again, first bits are both are 1. Then there are another case where first po differs in first position but same in second position. So again, this is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And similarly, there are fourth cases where they differ in both positions. So possible sets are like 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 1. Now, if no entanglement is shared either between referee and Alice and between R and B. So we are, not con we are considering a scenario so where no entanglement is shared between referee and Alice and referee and Bob. Now, if no entanglement is shared between Alice and Bob also, then two qubits from both parties are necessary. I'm not giving a proof of this thing, but I am claiming that if referee has to be, has to compare their, these two bits of Alice and two bits of Bob, then if you are in the classical world, then Alice has to send two qubits and Bob has to send also two qubits. Now we come to the quantum world and consider no entanglement, then again Alice has to send two qubits and Bob has to send two qubits. And here also as Alice sends his full information and Bob also sends his full information, then identities of bits with Alice and Bob are also revealed to the referee. So these are the two features that two, two qubits or two qubits are necessary if you don't consider any entanglement. And not only that, referee will know what is Alice's bits and what is what are the Bob bits. That will be completely revealed to referee. And we will see now if you can use creatively the entanglement between Alice and Bob's qubit, then actually just by sending one qubit from each Alice and Bob, you can have successful protocols and not only that, identities of particular bits of Alice and Bob will not be revealed to referee. Now, let us see the protocol itself. Yeah. So the protocol is something like this. Alice will have, Alice and Bob will have this two qubit entanglement. I, I mean, Alice will have a single qubit, Bob will have a single qubit, but they have been prepared in a a maximally entangled state phi plus, which we already, um, uh, 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 which already used in uh, super dense coding. With this resource, there is a successful protocol that we will see. And not only that, as we to as we tell, as I told, information of individuals will also remain secret to the referee. So protocol is something like this. Protocol is little bit complicated when you compare it with uh, super dense coding. So operation by Alice and Bob is something like this. So Alice's and Bob's both, 
bits may be either 0 0 0 1 1 0 and 1 these are the four possibilities if 0 0 is their bits then they don't apply nothing they don't apply any operation if it is 0 1 then they apply sigma j if their bits are 1 0 they apply sigma x if their bits are 1 1 then they apply first sigma j then sigma x then after this operation alice and bob both send their qubits to refree then refree first use this reverse operation reverse operation means the operation which takes a well state to a product state that we see that first c naught operation then hadamard operation and then refree measures both the qubits where the results can be either both bits where the result is either both are up, first is down, second is up, first is down, second is up. I have made a mistake. Now one of them will be one of them will be one zero and the other will be zero one. Maybe because of copying, I have made the mistake. And last one will be one one. So result will be something like this. If result both are up, then both bits are same. Conclusion of the referee will be both bits are same. If it is 1, 0, first bits are same. If it is 0, 1, second bits are same. And if the result is 1, 1, both bits are different. So there is a mistake in here. Now let us see how the protocol works. Let us consider the first case. So, first case is all bits are, all, uh, Alice's bits and Bob's, both the bits, they are same. So, either they are 0, 0, both are 0, 0 or both are 0, 1, both are 1, 0, both are 1, 1. Now, in this case, if you remember this operation, so then both will apply same operation. Both will apply same sigma operation. And if you consider this phi plus state and both applies the same sigma operation, phi plus will go to phi plus. It will not change. Now, if you consider case 2, if you consider case 2, where first bits are same, second bits are different, then of course Alice's and Bob's operation will be different. There will be two, four cases. Two cases will be like this. Alice will apply sigma 0. Sigma 0 means identity. Bob will apply sigma z. Or Alice will apply sigma z. Bob will apply sigma 0. And you can check phi plus will go to phi minus in this case. And in another two cases, Alice will apply sigma z and sigma x and Bob will apply sigma uh, sorry. Yeah. So Alice will apply sigma x, sigma z, Bob will apply sigma x, or Alice will apply sigma x, Bob will apply sigma x, sigma z. And then also you will see phi plus will go to phi minus. So in all these four for all these four cases where their first bits are same, second bit is different. The bail state, because of their unitary operation, unitary operation may be very different, but phi plus will go to, will be mapped to phi minus. Now, if you come to case three, where first bits are different, second bits are same, in this case also, operation will be something like this. For two cases, it will be Alice will apply sigma 0, Bob will apply sigma x, or Alice will apply sigma x, Bob will apply sigma 0. They are phi plus going to, phi plus will be transformed to phi plus. And in our last two cases, Alice will apply this and Bob will apply this, or their operation will be interchanged. Again, phi plus will go to phi plus. And in these fourth cases, uh, again, same thing. Alice will apply this, Bob will apply this, or Alice will apply this, Bob will apply this, but phi plus will go to phi minus, or in rest two cases, Alice will apply sigma z, Bob will apply sigma x, or the, they will interchange their operation according to their bits, and phi plus also goes to phi minus. So all these fourth cases, phi plus goes to phi minus. But see, finally, 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 
referee will apply C naught and then Hadamard. So referee will get either 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 1, according to the different, different bare state. So he can, he can easily tell, he will, sorry. So he can easily tell whether they are completely same, whether they differ in the second position and same in the first position, whether they differ in, in first position and same in second position, or whether they differ in both position. Therefore, you will come to the correct conclusion about regarding the bits, but no information about the bits will be conveyed. Because for all these four different different cases where they are completely same, the referee will see only a bare state. So referee will come to the conclusion whether they are completely same, but referee in no way understand whether this is the case or this is the case or this is the case or this is the case. So individual information of Alison and Bob will remain completely secret to the referee. This is the beauty of this thing. And also, if you, if you, if you consider in terms of, if you, if you consider in terms of quantum information processing, see, there are four possible cases. So how many, how many qubits has to be sent to referee to convey the information of four possible mutually exclusive information? two qubits are required. So that's why you see Alice is sending one qubit, Bob is sending one qubit. So finally, actually, four mutually exclusive information are being sent to referee. And also with two qubits, at most you can have, at most you can send four, as, as you are sending two qubits, at most you can send four mutually exclusive information. But actually there are, if you consider all these cases, there are 16 mutually exclusive information. And to send the full information about these 16 mutually exclusive information to referee, actually you need maybe, uh, maybe two Q, four qubits. Two qubits from Alice and two qubits from Bob has to be sent. But you are sending only two qubits from Alice Bob to referee. So at most you can send four mutually exclusive information. But actually there are 16 mutually exclusive information that they have been grouped in four. Completely same, differ in second position, differ in first position, and differ in both positions. And this only, these four information is being con are being conveyed to referee and referee came to the conclusion without knowing which particular bits Alice has or which particular bits Bob has. So this is the beauty of this uh, information processing protocol, which I may call fingerprinting. And finally, I'll make a, I, 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 I'll finish by making this comment. Quantum information processing tasks actually exploits various no-go principles. That uh, actually there are more no-go principles uh, than we I, I, I just discussed. Uh, in my first uh, two, three slides. Uh, so quantum information processing actually exploits various uh, no-go principles of quantum mechanics in useful information processing tasks. And in particular, if you consider this uh, no-go principle like no cloning, no information without disturbance, because in quantum mechanics without perfect measurement, you cannot get any information about the state. So you can tell this principle that no information without disturbance and monogamous nature of entanglement that we I have not discussed because uh, monogamous nature of entanglement tends that if two particles are very much entanglement, they, they cannot be correlated with the third particle. So if you, so if you consider these three no-go statements, uh, this no cloning, no information without disturbance and monogamous nature of entanglement, then you can have Secret key generation, BB84 protocol, and secret key generation used by Eckhart in 1991. Similarly, if you consider entanglement and quantum various quantum operations, uh, you get dense coding that we discussed, quantum teleportation discovered in 1993, and quantum secret sharing and data hiding, which we didn't discuss 
And if you use entanglement and quantum non-locality, quantum non-locality is a very interesting thing. And it is it actually uses Bell's theorem, which tells that quantum statistics cannot be reproduced by any local realistic theory. And indeed, quantum force, quantum mechanics violates this best inequality. And that's why quantum mechanics has shows some kind of non-locality without actually violating the no signaling principle. And if you can creatively use this entanglement and quantum non-locality, you get device independent cryptography, advantages in quantum communication and generation of randomness. These three are very, very interesting topics and it is very active area of our recent research. And finally, I thank everybody for your patient hearing. Thank you. Okay, I have finished. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Guru Prasad Kaur, for this wonderful pedagogic talk. And uh, now we are open for questions. So if any of the students have some questions, you can either write in the chat box or also you can uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So while we were uh, while we are waiting for uh, some questions, uh, let me just ask you some general uh, thing about the last slide. Since you have worked so much on also post quantum uh, correlations, yeah. So coming from that side, I mean, is it possible to select out certain of these no go uh, principles? Uh, or are they kind of democratic uh, from that point of view? I mean, am I clear? <laughs> can I? Can you follow what I'm asking? Oh, maybe you may be asking that I have classified some of the no-go principles and and tell that uh, they are actually they generate all these protocols. But yes. maybe yeah, you may be correct that uh, maybe they are using other things in quantum mechanics in some way. But these are the fundamental feature that are responsible for this quantum information processing. And in particular, if you go post-quantum uh, non-locality, uh, especially PR box kind of thing, then I can tell you that this idea of device independent cryptography actually uh, came, idea came from this uh, PR box uh, non-local correlation. Because if you have PR box, then you, you have if, if, because PR correlation is very, very peculiar. Because PR box correlation is a correlation which is monogamous without any reference to a particular physical theory. But in quantum world, if you consider maximally entangled state or well state, they are monogamous because of the peculiar structure of quantum mechanics. But if you consider this correlation of quantum mechanics given by this Bell state, then they are not monogamous if you see those correlation in the general setting of no signaling correlation. So main idea, this is very interesting question. Main idea of this device independent cryptography and even then generation of randomness, they came from idea of post quantum uh, correlations. Actually, initial idea. Then people were thinking how some of the quantum correlation can be exploited to have device independent cryptography as well as device independent generation of randomness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions? So, since if there are no more questions, we are almost at the end. Yeah, if someone reads, I, uh, I am not very used to this. Uh, so, can you read someone? Ha, can you please read? Yeah, yeah, organize it. Yes, yes. So, may, or maybe should I read it? Okay. So, uh, one the first was from uh, Chandramani and uh, asking do the protocol are same for discrete and continuous source? So, which protocol? I don't know. But uh, the question is that is the protocol same for discrete and continuous? No, I am not. I, yeah, I have not considered any continuous system. Continuous system may be a little more complex, but here these qubits are sufficient. Okay, so the next question is from Hussein. 
is it necessary to always create orthogonal states when sharing information between different users yeah if you we want to decode the information uh, successful decode of the inform classical information you need orthogonal states because if it is not orthogonal then they cannot be discriminated that's why i discuss this thing yeah if you encode this information regarding this four possible measurement results of sorry uh sorry sorry so four possible four possible results of this match if you encode them sorry if you encode them in a signal qubit using these four states then you can encode it but if you send the particle to your friend he will not be able to decode the message because these four states are not orthogonal and in quantum mechanics this is very strict principle you cannot distinguish among non orthogonal states and more powerful theorem will tell that if the set of the state is linearly dependent the probability of distinguishing among the state is zero okay and then there is a question by mohammad tanvir about while fermion in quantum computing but this is not related to your talk so i i will skip this question and finally there is a question by devdat sharma the question is why we apply c not followed by hadamard gate to measure in x basis how can we explain this mathematically because every time c not followed by hadamard gate do not construct projective operators with respect to state which are being measured by us so the question why we apply c not followed by hadamard gate to measure in x basis so if you can just uh, yeah very for that yeah here i have if you if you consider two qubits if you apply hadamard on the two qubits are in both are in zero if you have had apply hadamard on first and then c not operation on both these qubits this is the actually entangling operation then you get this max, maximally entangled state which is one of the bell state and if you apply the reverse operation i mean this unitary operation in the reverse order and if you apply to one of the bell state it goes to product state actually you can without using this thing you can discriminate among this four bell state by measuring in the bell basis itself but if you want to measure to make your measurement on qubits separately i like you want the simple measurement like measuring measuring in spin operator along z direction then this is very useful that from the bell state you go to the product state and then separately on the qubits you measure sigma z this is very simple measurement that's why this c not operation and hadamard are used okay thank you so much so let us once again thank professor guru prasad kaur for the wonderful